the founding deputy commissioner of the GSA's Technology Transformation Service, and was executive director and co-founder of 18F. His first gig in government was as one of president was as one of President Obama's Presidential Innovation Fellows. You couldn't sneak some USDS time in there just to complete the set. Uh, he was an honorary member the whole time. Don't worry. Excellent. Hit the red button on your mic. <laughs> um, but you know who did sneak in some time at USDS? Erie Meyer, who helped found it. Uh, USDS is using the best of product design and engineering to transform how government works for the American people. No small task. Prior to launching USDS, she served as the senior advisor to the USCTO and at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's watershed tech and innovation team. If you've noticed a massive improvement in uh, the citizen experience with student loans, credit reporting, and weighing in on consumer finance regulations, we have Erie and her former team to thank. Woohoo! Uh, now at Code for America, she's a co founder of the Tech Lady Mafia, which supports women who work in and around the internet. And last but not least, down at the end, we've got Mr. Laurent Crenshaw, the hardest working man in open government. Uh, he is now the director of public policy for Yelp and an 11 year veteran of the wild and woolly world of the United States Congress. I could read the litany of your congressional service, but it's basically everything except the Capitol Police. <laughs> Did you serve in the Capitol Police? No. Um, the bulk of his time on Capitol Hill was as legislative director for Congressman Darrell Issa, where among many other things, he spearheaded the successful opposition to SOPA and PIPA, keeping the internet open and out of the clutches of the content industry. You know, nothing major. Um, and with that, let's roll the videotape. Um, do we want to... Can I have like two seconds to set Absolutely. it up? Absolutely. So what you're about to see is real. Uh, it's a... A uh, veteran who regularly struggles with homelessness named Dominic. Uh, he, what he is trying to do is to apply for health care, and he is not successful. And then you'll see another video where he is, the first video he's trying a product as it was at the VA, and in the second attempt he's trying what is now live at the VA. Um, I like to open with this because when we talk to people about digital services, either they get really excited or their eyes glaze over. Um, I want to root it in what is actually happening to human beings, which is why we're starting here. So with that, let's, let's see Dominic. So what you're about to see is real. Uh, it's a uh, veteran who regularly struggles with homelessness named Dominic. Uh, he, what he is trying to do is to apply for health care, and he is not successful. And then you'll see another video where he is, the first video he's trying a product as it was at the VA, and in the second attempt he's trying what is now live at the VA. Um, I like to open with this because when we talk to people about digital services, either they get really excited or their eyes glaze over. Um, I want to root it in what is actually happening to human beings, which is why we're starting here. So with that, let's, let's see Dominic. I've been to va.gov a few times. Uh, I know I've been on this website before. I don't remember any of my login information though for my health uh, event. Okay. So what did I, you I, I've that been on that. For? Uh, it, when I when I signed in for something on here, it directed me to that, and I just remember it popping up and there being a link for it. Um, I know I've done this with finding the VA phone for everything, which is sometimes it's really easy, sometimes it's not. I know I feel that this 1010 easy so many times, it's like ridiculous. Is this what you expected to happen when you clicked on that? That? No. No, I actually expected it to open the website. Okay. Um, so why don't you go ahead and click on that again? And let's go ahead and click Advanced. Let's click Proceed. Now this is the last time I saw this. This is how it started up, where it allowed me to be able to start now with trying to enroll. Okay. And again, like I said, I got about halfway through it, and then all of a sudden it was like, why do I not understand this? What is the terminology that they're trying to use in this? Because this doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. 
And that's when I ended up calling the 800 number to get someone to walk with me through it because I was like, look, I'm having an issue. I don't understand what you guys are asking for. And I've seen this come up too a few times uh-huh. where it's like, you need, you need an updated PDF for it. I'm like, why? Okay. What are your impressions on this page? What do you think it means? This is annoying that you can't use whatever current pre- PDF browser that you have. Like, if you got Adobe, the current form of Adobe, you can't open this. This is the problem. This is a huge problem because some people don't have the finances to upgrade their Adobe or to even upgrade their, to a, a computer that carries the current flash drive or, you know, PDF reader on it. Uh, and how many times have you seen this before? Uh tell you last year alone I've probably seen this about maybe a dozen times. What did you do next? I think the last time, the last five times I just went to the library. Went to the library? Yep. Did it work there? Uh, twice. Twice? Twice I had to work there. That was one of those was the same day that I called the VA and the woman told me, after she had me on hold, that they couldn't help me. Yeah. Um, so for context, when he's applying every single time, Every one of those that even got through to the VA, the VA treated as a new case. Uh, So it was slowing down even the successful submission and processing of claims. So then this is the redesign, the next video. I have the first video. Oh, all right. Well, we will share on the internet the redesign, uh, which he, as he filled it out, um, he expresses, uh, well, the, the government should start doing things like this because it is so simple to fill out. He is actually successful. Um, and he, he said that uh, he felt like the first form had been telling to go blank himself and the second form looked like it actually cared about him. And this is a gentleman a little bit older than me who had served his country and was just trying to sign up for health care he was entitled to. And that's, it, this is an amazing thing, and thank you for, for bringing this to start. This is all about people. Digital services is about people. And I think we've heard a couple times today uh, the notion of an iPhone in our pocket. Ten years ago this summer, right, the iPhone came out, and a frustration that government can't get this right, which is its sole reason for being. But what what's really possible, and what have you guys experienced with federal di- digital services team um, in this day and age? I'm... I've been talking a bunch, so I'll just keep going. Um, I, <clears throat> the thing that has been um, most wild to me is the there's a huge gap between people who are familiar with technology, who are comfortable with technology, and people in government who have been sold technology that doesn't work, have been told that they are not technical enough to understand what the situation is, or don't feel like they have access to buy the technology they want, to hire the engineers they want. Um, there's, there's just this huge gap. There have been efforts. The idea of making government uh, technology and government work better, it's not new. That idea in itself is not revolutionary. What is revolutionary is orienting that work on the thing that should be true. So if somebody sells you a, a bill of like, we're going to modernize technology with our technology modernization technology, like, please do not buy that. But if somebody says, we want to make it faster and easier to get health care, and that's the metric we're judging, and we're going to empower technical people to work with the experts who've been toiling for years to fix this inside of a bureaucracy, please believe in that. Um, the VA... Uh, The fact that I showed you a video of a veteran that they care deeply about crashing and burning as he tries to get help shows how willing they are to put their necks out to say, like, what we currently have in a couple cases is broken and we're doing everything we can to fix it. One of the things that's been most exciting is even after the transition, both the secretary and the deputy secretary of the VA have continued to support what is still a top flight engineering team that is building and fixing systems like that. That is from over a year ago. They ship multiple times a day every single day. If you're from Silicon Valley, that seems like, why is that strange? If you're from government, you know that you're used to once a year, twice a year if you're quote unquote agile. Um, so I, I think that there's been a bunch of momentum, there's more to come, but when you engage in these conversations, don't get stuck into like a cyber swirl of buzzwords. Ask about who you want to get what type of help and how that can be made possible. Yeah, I, I, I think most folks still don't have a good conception of what 
of how much better it can actually be. And, and, and that, those are conversations we had early on, especially. I, I, it's, it's definitely getting better. I, I, you know, at the beginning, um, and, and some of this is frame of reference management, right? So, like, you know, it's easier to explain, for instance, um, that your $100 million IT, you know, development and maintenance contract it's easier to say, well, that could have been done for 50 million um, than to say the truth, which is that it could be done for 10 million. <laughs> um, and, you know, so, so one of the things we do early on uh, with 18F when we were, so we, we 18F worked on, a, works on a client model. We, you know, we partner with agency folks who pay 18F to, um, to deliver services. And one of the things we do is early on is we'd, um, we'd bring an engineer to a business development meeting. So a first, first touch meeting with someone from an agency, a program officer who really has no familiarity with what we're about. And, um, and so in the first five or ten minutes, we'd dig around for you know, something, some interesting problem that they're, they're having, just small talk. And, and we'd go on and do the pitch and discuss how we work and what the relationship will be like and so on. And sort of at the end of this hour, oh, by the way, you know, Alan back here has been writing some code while we were talking, and this is the thing he made to solve your problem. And um, and and y'all will know that it's fairly easy to throw a little website up that does a little search and shows some results. And um, and and that's when sort of jaws would drop <laughs> half the time because folks, you know, wait, 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 you can make code work in an hour. <laughs> um, like there's just no, you know. A lot of folks have been fed a bill of get goods um, about what's possible and what's not, and so that I, I really believe is like the number one job of folks in this is is just to to help people become savvier customers of all of this. So. Um, the the other side of that is I have friends who are veterans themselves who are working at sub 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 contractors to try and fix some of these problems, um, but the way that the current procurement infrastructure works, it doesn't always re uh, reward excellent work. So as a country, it's no surprise probably to folks in this room, we send about $86 billion a year in federal money on uh, federal IT. We are not getting $86 billion worth of value. And some of that's our own fault. Um, when we're not able to hire the best companies directly, when competitions aren't actually competitive because there's so much bureaucracy around the requirements to even bid, um, we are holding back some of the best tech companies that could really provide um, better better solutions than, than they're currently able to provide. Can I ask a question of the crowd? Um, who here has ever tried to buy technology as a member of the government? Yeah, it sucks, right? Um, do you want to share what it was like? All right. <laughs> See? It's that bad. Um, so, so one of the things that... It, uh, just uh, now that I work in Silicon Valley, I can make fun of those people. But one of the things that always sort of shocks me is when people in Silicon Valley are like, why do people think it costs $11 billion to build s a system like that? And the answer is that nobody thinks it should cost that much money. It's just every single incentive is set up to make it cost that much money, right? There's no, it, the, the, the thing that when I'm talking Silicon Valley people into coming to work for the government, well, they say like, well, why don't you just fire the guy that's ruining everything? And I'm, I'm like, sweetheart, if there was a person in the basement of the VA petting a cat and cackling, like, I would love to fire him. But like, the, the larger problem is, is the system of, of incentives and, and the questions that we ask. How many people here are um, uh, congressional staffers? I said, what? Not, not many. Um, sir, what do you do? Me? Yeah. Oh, I'm a vendor at Capitol Hill, so I write, I write the software that congressional staffers use. There you go. Do you love how those contracts have to be structured in order to win business? No. Well, generally, because Congress is not going to be able Yeah. It could be a lot better. So speaking of Capitol Hill, Laurent, um, this is not rocket science, or so it seems. Um, what's the what's the gap? How are USDS 18F, the Innovation Fellows Program, how are they perceived and supported or not uh, on Capitol Hill? Well, I think that there's been uh, a transition, a positive transition that's occurred over the last few years. You know, obviously, uh, all of these services came in the wake of healthcare.gov and uh, that botched initial rollout of the site. Um, 
But then there was a realization by the administration that they needed the services that uh, 18NF, Presidential Innovation Fellows, and everyone else could provide in order to fix that problem. And then thankfully, they didn't just stop there. You know, there were obviously a lot of other problematic areas within the federal government that could use the service of technologists, and uh, thankfully they were willing to uh, devote their time for often a lot of instances a lot less money in order to come and do that. Um, and overall, the perception on the Hill was that it was a su successful program. You know, um, it was reauthorized, it was made permanent, and so it's lasting on. And I think that after a certain period of time, those who understood technology on Capitol Hill and wanted Congress to work better actually said, man, look like they're actually getting results over there within the administration, and we're still going through the same sort of um, antiquated or um, 20th century processes in order to try to get uh, new systems, new results, and new technology on the Hill. And I think that that perception and that shift has really been fascinating and interesting. And so hopefully they'll be able, Congress will be able to bridge that gap in the near future as well, whether through a congressional digital service or something similar to that. Um, in order to have similar individuals in place to what uh, 18 and F and the Presidential Innovation Fellows were able to do and, and for um, the administration. And, you know, I think looking at that, so I, I, I feel like there's a general excitement within Congress there. You know, I sort of look at it from, with two hats now, because on one end I still wear my, uh, you know, congressional hat. I like to say that after 11 years I got released for time served, which, you know, <laughs> uh, I think most of you guys understand. And then also from a Yelp hat, though, because, um, a lot of the problems that you're talking about that when you're talking with agencies about addressing are no-brainers from, um, from the commercial side. You're not just going to throw a ton of data on a platform and not make it usable and say, look, we did this for you know, $50 million and it's up there. Our job is done. No, you're going to make it as user-friendly as possible because in the commercial sector, thankfully, you have alternatives. If you don't like y how Yelp's information is displayed, you can go to TripAdvisor or somewhere else and see it there. And so there are all of these incentives for um, – commercial entities to always iterate, make the products better in order to make a better experience for the consumer or end user, whereas generally speaking, government hasn't had that. And thankfully, what you all did started to bridge, started to bridge that gap and continues to, and I think that there are certain problems uh, on the congressional side in that that without that same sort of experience happening is that you still have all of these antiquated systems, either in the way that Congress uses technology internally or in the way that people interact with Congress. And certainly there are social media and other commercial tools that are out there, but generally speaking, like whether it's the form letter system or the way in which, you know, um, through IQ, I hope, uh, forgive me for s calling them out if anyone's from there is in the room, but just using that as sort of the main uh, mail tracking system in which um, congressional offices communicate it with their constituents. And so I think that there's a lot of room for innovation. Yeah. Yeah, are you sure? Oh, sorry. Well, I was going to say, uh, so we get refugees from Congress who would sneak over to the digital service office and say, please don't tell anyone I'm here, however, and it would be exactly, you know, our vendors are really smart, but the way that we have to buy their services sucks. Like, it, it, it's not iterative where we try something, where we're testing the riskiest assumption and changing it a little bit. We have to lock into these very long contracts, and sometimes we're shooting ourselves in, in the foot. The other things are, like, we would love to have a designer on staff. Like, if we could have a designer who could look at a problem and say, like, Actually, it might be way cheaper to do it this way rather than somebody who is just the way the incentives work always going to say, like, I think we should blow this up into a huge thing. Um, one of the stories that I like to tell and that my friends in Congress staffers uh, are jealous of is we were working on a project with the Department of Education. Um, it was trying to help consumers uh, make it possible for them to do apples to apples comparisons of outcomes of higher education institutions. And it was like this really great policy idea, but how was it going to come true? So less than 12 hours after we got the assignment, we were outside talking to students and families. We started with the user. The conversation started there. It didn't, it didn't start on the day of the launch like healthcare.gov when they saw it for the first time. So I think you're totally right about the needs in Congress. My father worked in the Ohio Senate for 35 years, um, and so it's not the big Congress, but as somebody who really is passionate about constituent work, he, he continues to be 
shocked at the resources that are available to really help constituents and make them super happy. I, I never thought I was going to get love letters from constituents who got like proper service, but we, we got them for the digital service teams for 18F and for the agencies that were able to use those services. Yeah, if you watch C-SPAN for just a few hours, you'll hear countless the American people, but God forbid you have to go outside and talk to an American person, right? Yeah. Um, you showed this video uh, to people on Capitol Hill. Aaron, I know that you've introduced these concepts to a lot of members and staff and that sort of decision maker level. Like, how does this stuff hit those people? Um, you know, something that has always been a huge question mark in my brain is, hey, we've got members trekking out to Silicon Valley, to, you know, Google HQ, to Twitter HQ, to Facebook HQ, and then trekking back and nothing changes. I mean, what's the, how does it hit those people? Who's, who are ultimately on the line when bad technology rears its head? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, the natural reaction is the obvious one. It is, it is the one that a lot of folks have, which is, geez, we should be able to do that. What can we do to make, make you know, and, and there's a lot of, what can we do to help? What can we, you know, what can we do to make this more, to make this better? And so, you know, the Presidential Innovation Fellows is now law, and, uh, you know, there are, you know, there are bills, there's at least one bill, <laughs> uh, you know, in process now to, to further fund and make it easy, you know, because a big piece of this is also how, you know, how government projects are financed is not how great technology products are you know, and services are built today, <laughs> right, for the most part. So, so there's a whole piece of that. Um, th there's frankly been a, a lot of, you know, at least the voicing of support and, and in, and in pockets, there's been the actual, you know, enactment of support uh, for these programs, which has been terrific. Um, you know, Congress doesn't move that fast. <laughs> the government does not move that fast. Um, but, you know, I, I'm cautiously optimistic. You know, that said, it's hard to, for, you know, it's hard to get folks to make this their top priority, right? I mean, in a political climate where so many things become so important, become so dramatic, you know, investing in what is perceived as sort of an infrastructure issue um, is, is, you know, can be a hard sell, which is why it's so important to tell the stories, right? It's why, US, you know, it's why VA made that video. It's why USDS and 18 have spent so much time, you know, talking about what we do as well as doing because, because that, that's the piece that's important, right? Once folks understand what's possible and, and how much better things could be, more people start to mobilize. Um, so I want to lovingly push back on my beloved college, colleague, um, Aaron. So <clears throat> when, when I've shown this video before, the reaction universally is anger. People cannot believe that it's this bad for people who are counting on us, and they can't believe that the efforts to fix it are unique. Their question is, why hasn't this already been done? How can we make it move faster? How dare we treat our veterans, our students, our, like, you know, insert any of the users you're trying to serve? And I think that, to your point, it is difficult to get people to prioritize in infrastructure, but I think, like, the true leaders in Congress and the true leaders across every industry realize that technology is not like a vertical technology is how you do everything. You know, there's the famous phrase of software eating the world. Software has already eaten how your constituents are expecting to be served and taken care of and valued and respected in the things that you're offering them or the things that you need from them. And I think that for me, I mean, I spent a, I spent a semester at the Kennedy School doing a fellowship helping do lots of things, but what I heard there over and over and over again is how can public policy schools be teaching how to write legislation that fundamentally transforms this and sees this as a primary mode of service rather than a thing to say, wow, we got to figure this out before it hits the street, which always turns out super well. Um, so I'm going to give a, a shout out quickly to a uh, member of Congressman, of Congress, uh, Congressman Ron Kind from Wisconsin. So for years, Congressman Kind um, <clears throat> had been advocating for a Yelp for government. You know, he would go down to the floor and say, we ought to have a Yelp for government. Agencies ought to be utilizing the information that they're getting in, in order to create a better two-way conversation to better serve their constituents or the, the uh, American public. And after a couple of years of him saying that, he actually reached out to us and said, hey, are you guys doing anything with the government? Now, the problem was, the answer to that question actually was that we were trying to. But 
we were precluded for a period of time still because of the certain processes that are in place just to get a government terms of service agreement in order to get certified so that agencies could actually claim their pages to look at the reviews and the content and commentary that have been up there. And just to put it in context, we have around 100,000 or so pages for uh, government offices at the federal, state, and local level uh, with, you know, and you s extrapolate that by the hundreds or dozens of comments on each page. Um, but the challenge was that this information was out there. Government wasn't allowed to get access to it until we negotiated the separate terms of service agreement. And also there were no, uh, there, there wasn't a, capa a capacity or capability for us to get access to the government information at that time to figure out new and better ways to incorporate it onto our own pages. And I think that that's still part of the challenge as well, just from a, a data standpoint that hopefully we're moving further on as the Data Act finally sort of moves into its full implementation. but. On one end, I think it's great that, uh, you know, uh, at and f and the Presidential Innovation Fellows have worked to make these systems better, but on the other end, it's, it's frustrating looking at it from, the, uh, from a commercial side or from a corporate side in that it's just so cumbersome for us to, like, actually try to get access to that information in order to do some of the things that we'd really be interested in doing ourselves. Like on the state and local level, we work with uh, various health departments around the country. They give us all of their data on health and food scores for restaurants, and we assign a number to that and put that on the page separately from what you would see along with uh, the overall Yelp rating. That's a great way for us as a commercial site to utilize government data and provide it in a way that's functional and usable to the public, and we know that they're actually going to go there. Um, like I was really, uh, the VA obviously we've been saying a lot of positive things about them and I think that they've been making great strides to improve, but I was a little taken aback when they posted uh, sort of advertising their new platform that they said Yelp for ah. VA Hospital. I also, I went to Yelp and <laughs> took screenshots of the hospitals that have already been rated yes. on Yelp. <laughs> exactly. And. We're still trying to basically work with them because we, I've said, you know, we'd love to get access to your information or at least have you claim your Yelp pages so you can take this content and commentary in there as well. And so I think that they're just, I, I guess the long roundabout way to get back to the point is that there are members of Congress who are interested and they have talked about using platforms like Yelp and I think that there are a lot of other platforms that are out there that can be further integrated in ways that don't have to go through an RFP or the traditional process so the government can have more access to that usable data. Could I just add, uh, so to close that loop, that's why the digital service teams are so important, right? Because what I, I think the divide, what you're seeing is like the, is the gap between folks in government who want to get that done and you on the outside, you know, as a third, as a third party provider, as a private vendor providing a service and you know, you know something's possible, you don't know the, you know, the bureaucratic path through. They know they want to get something done. They don't, you know, they don't, they don't understand what, what you're actually capable of providing. And, and this is, you know, if there's no, if there's no one in the middle who's, who's able to sort of Sherpa the, you know, <laughs> folks to get, you know, into one path together, you know, you just keep crossing in the night, right? <laughs> also brings it back to something we were discussing earlier. So if somebody said the problem is we need a Yelp for VA hospitals, you are not going to get as good of an implementation if you said it needs to be clear and obvious to a veteran which hospitals are performing better. Like if you started from that problem statement, then they would have in market research and user research heard that veterans are like, oh, I look at Yelp. Um, and worked on, you know, prioritized perhaps a data infrastructure project instead or a data sharing project instead. But when you start with, oh, the, the solution is this specific piece of, of technology, a Yelp for VA hospitals, you're not thinking through all of the opportunities you have to take advantage of, of what's already out there. And I think this is also a good illustration of why we need to play the entire orchestra. So sometimes, that's another funny thing, when I talk to people, so I mentioned my dad, my mom is a county government official. She works on a computer called a Compaq 386. It's about as old as I am. Um, so when I talk to her about the work we were doing at the digital service, she goes, oh, so you're just going to fix fix government with a few engineers in two years. Good luck, sweetie. Love ya. 
Um, and uh, you know, and it's always fun to have a cynic as a mom. But I, th I also think that like it's a fair question. But the the solution is not a particular piece of software. The solution is not one engineer, one team. The solution is this entire orchestra working together. From the Presidential Innovation Fellows who are trying out huge ideas and testing our riskiest assumptions about how we could solve a problem, to 18F who are building platforms that are completely built in the open and open source so that agencies can adopt them all across the country and world, to the I don't know, do you call it ActStack in public? What do you call it? The Tech Transformation Service has a really interesting acquisition team that's figuring out ways for Schedule 70 vendors. I have no idea how nerdy you are pro about procurement, but as existing GSA designation for companies, it's easier to do business with. Um, having a transparent way for them to compete so the people who are best at writing software can get access to even more contracts. To the digital service that are embedded in the agency, directly in the agencies like the VA, where we have veterans who are software engineers. We also have people from the VA that joined that team because they wanted to do that work but do it together. And also our external partners. Uh, and not even a formal partnership, but some people working on technology in this country to try and make it better are like a little P partner for all of this work. And whether it's Yelp thinking about how they can make it easier for veterans to choose the right VA hospital for them, or whether it's Google, that right now if you Google um, uh, you know, University of Phoenix, you can see they have a 17.5 graduation rate. Um, and you can see that data comes from the Department of Education. The inside and outside, everybody should be pushing for the same thing, which is for things like this to work properly. It should be insane that things are working like they are in some cases today. Where I'm from, if a mayor doesn't shovel the snow by the end of a weekend, he's gone the next year. Um, when that is how your constituents are now feeling about really poor service, and I don't even think there's value designating between digital and not because they aren't making that designation. That is the s level of service you're offering them. Amen. I uh, just want to pick up on a thread, but wanted, are you guys down for some audience questions in a few minutes? Cool. I want to make sure we have enough time. Um, I've seen a lot in legislative environments a very binary view of this. We either have to hire a vendor we're going to do it all in-house. And I love the term you use, Yuri, the, the it's an orchestra approach. You know, it's not just the violins. It's not just the bassoon, right? It's everybody playing towards the same piece of music. Um, but I also know, looking at you know the very short growth arc of USDS and 18F, that uh, playing well with vendor, the vendor community in both directions hasn't always happened. Um, what has that been like? What are the lessons learned for uh, a transformational digital services team working with career technologists on one hand and uh, the vendor community on the other? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, we, so, wow, lots of lessons. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think the biggest one is the one we were just talking about a minute ago, which is that, um, you know, so when we, w when we started 18F, um, you know, with like 10, 15 folks. Um, the, the initial idea was, all right, let's just show what's possible. Let's just do some demonstrations. Let's write some code, right? Let's do some design and write some code, I should, I should say. Um, and, uh, you know, and so the, the, the picture was developed, I think, quickly. Oh, h &F wants to build websites and compete with vendors for all of the website work for all of the federal government. Um, it, it, it was never <laughs> a, a, a part of the plan, uh, you know. The, the you know because ATNF could have hired five thousand people and still not touched anywhere close to all of the websites and web services and, and technology that the go federal government needs and provides. Um, and and so quickly out of that came you know the consultation and and the beginnings of um, the the acquisition related platforms uh, platform work and. Um, and, and and you see the shift that's happening, right? Which is that 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 really, you know, what what these organizations are trying to do wherever possible is, you know, is figure out how to build the right relationship between folks in house and the private sector, right? And very often the private sector has an answer already. Um, if they don't, they have pieces of an answer that we can try and work and put together. If, you know, sometimes they don't. Sometimes, it, sometimes, cust look, sometimes custom code is required and it is gonna need to be written, you know, 
uh, by vendors we hire, or sometimes by folks in house. And 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 you know, and, and I got to say, like part part of part of keeping you know engineers and designers on staff isn't it, it, part of it is absolutely uh, informing purchase decisions. Part of it is also making sure that there are folks who know what they're doing and who can continue to demonstrate what is the latest and greatest, what is the bar that should be set, what should program officers and contracting officers throughout government expect for the dollars they spend on digital. And so that, that's, sort of where, that's, that's where the mix is, but I think that, that you know, the ACSTAC team and the, the ACTAC team <laughs> at USDS um, and other efforts have, have really started to, to build a lot of constructive bridges and you see a lot of uh, pockets all over government um, where folks are starting to understand how to build better, more productive, and dare I say, more cost-effective relationships uh, with vendors who are delivering a higher quality of service faster and cheaper. I have two mini stories on this topic. Um, one is the cement boat problem. So if you're the government, sometimes we, and I'm not a Fed anymore, but I'll pretend I am, we say, I, I need a cement boat by this date. Uh, and if you don't have somebody who knows about boats or knows about cement on staff, no one's gonna say to you, you might want to think about saying, I want to get across this lake and letting the experts in cements in boats figure out that like maybe wood would work better than a cement boat. So being over prescriptive at the beginning of a procurement actually locks out the best vendors anyways um, from doing these contracts really well and having work they can be proud of. Uh, one of my very favorite stories of this success was, and, and this is partially a Code for America story, um, the Department of uh, California Department of Children's Services, this is where foster children are tracked throughout the process. And for context, if we don't know when the last time somebody checked on them was, children who are vulnerable can fall through the cracks. This is, this is a really serious system that needs to work properly. They were writing a huge new contract for like the next 10 years. They reached out for Code for America and said, will this work? And we said, no. Um, so <laughs> they said, oh crap, what do we do? Um, and so 18S uh, jumped in, and they took a stack of specifications that was more than a thousand page long, pages long, and made it less than ten pages long by actually outlining the problems they wanted to solve, rather than the button must be this color and on the fourth page. Like it's like it's so much better because it's actually oriented on what you want to come out for the for the students, and it's a modular contract, which also means that more companies have a chance to build this really great technology. Can I, can I just add? On that last note, the fact that the contract is modular is actually super important in government. Um, and the reason is this. The, the hoops you have to jump through, <coughs> the amount of time it takes, the amount of delay, the amount of protest uh, is proportional to the size of the contract, right? So a $100 million contract takes a lot longer and is a lot more difficult and is a lot more likely to go in the wrong direction than 10 $5 million contracts, right? Um, uh, the, the, they're just an order of magnitude faster and easier to execute. They, they also, um, they, you know, and <laughs> they also uh, disperse risk, right? So if something goes wrong with a $100 million contract, the whole $100 million contract is failing. If you have five or six $5 million contracts um, and one of them goes south, you still can Still not the best. Still, <laughs> not, still not the best, right? But, but first of all, you know, use, you know, in hopefully using the methods we're talking about, we're, we're reducing the, the, the chance of that, um, and we're increasing the speed with which we come to that conclusion, so we spend less of that money before discovering that we're going down the wrong path. But, but if one of them does go wrong, um, for any number of reasons, you know, you can swap that one out, and your project is still more or less on track, and you haven't wasted, you know, $100 million of taxpayer money. So, I mean, they're, they're really, you know, you know it, it, is a, it is a convenience um, and frankly like probably comforting to a lot of contracting officers to do one big contract for the whole thing, right? It is the way that folks have learned how to do the, and, and look, and if you're buying, you know, if you're buying a warplane, right, that's probably the right way to do it, right? I, I, don't, I don't know that you want to like module, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know anything about building warplanes, but, I, but, 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 but I imagine that, you know, that, that, that planning from start to finish before you start building is a good idea. Um, in software, that's generally not true, and in, certainly in, in software providing services to the public, that is absolutely not true, um, because you need the feedback of the public as you go, <laughs> of the users of the system, and not just the public, but the government staffers that are gonna use the system as well as you go in order to make sure you're building the best product you can. Um, so, yeah, anyway. 
So before we go uh, to take a question or two from the audience, I'll start with you, Laurent. Um, you've got that 30, you've got that 30 second ride with the boss in the elevator uh, going from the office down to the garage. They're about to take off. Uh, what's the one thing that you would tell uh, your member about or translating some of this digital services magic from one end of Pennsylvania Avenue to the other? Um, I would tell my member that at the end of the day, it ends up providing a greater uh, net result for uh, significantly less cost. Because at the end of the day, you know, Congress um, has what, a budget of like $2.4 billion dollars around that uh, in total for all of the offices and their operations. And you've got members' offices whose budgets, I think generally if you look from like 2007 through 2016, they've actually gone down by something like 13 to 20%. Don't quote me on that. I, I would say around 13% or so. It's a About little- 22% 22%, sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Seamus. Um, but they range between like 1.1 to 1.4 million, I think per house office, and then it's a little bit more where it's more on the Senate side, but they're asked to do more. They're asked to uh, engage in their with their constituents in more and more ways to respond, either whether it's directly to legislation, whether it's for you know certain services and assistance with them with federal agencies, or if it's just correspondence, whether it comes in the form of a letter, of a phone call, of a tweet, of a Facebook post, and of many other things as well, along with additional services that they provide back in their district. And at the end of the day, having uh, a team of technologists, engineers, designers, and experts that would be in-house for Congress to use would allow for uh, a way better adaptation of services for much less cost so that they can deal with the new challenges going forward rather than the traditional model, which has generally been the House Administration Committee or the Speaker will choose one vendor out of the RFPs that they get, and then you're stuck with that, as you said, for a couple of years. And, um, you know, it, it's built to a problem rather than to a long term help the constituent solution. And I think that that's part of the challenge is that it's built to a certain spec, that spec becomes outdated, and things change, and it takes another five years to get to that. And so I think iteration and lower costs are what uh, I would iterate to my boss. Aaron? I, I'd, I'd come back to the first question today, which is, you know, um, there are things that are possible in government service that you don't imagine yet. You can't, you haven't imagined yet. Um, and you know, folks doing modern digital, doing modern service design, doing modern tech design, doing modern, app, you know, uh, development, um, they, they are much closer to being able to imagine those things than folks who aren't knee deep in it, um, who don't do it for a living. Um, you want those folks here. You want them sitting with you and talking to you about what you need, about what your day, your, what your day is like, about what the public wants from your office. <laughs> um, and you want them thinking creatively about how to, how to serve better, right? Um, I would call someone on the phone who had tried to get help and failed and have them tell their story instead. Amen. On that note, any questions from the audience? Questions? I'm glad that was so super clear. Oh, oh. We have one up here. <laughs> yeah. I'll jump in. Um, to Erie and to Aaron, if you were going to be building a congressional digital service, what would you do first? I would get the correct operational leader for them to report to. If they were reporting to the CIO, I would cancel the project. Um, if in an agency, we would walk away unless we're reporting to the deputy secretary. And the deputy secretary in, a sec in an agency is like the COO of the company. And that is so, you can do nothing else if, you, if the reporting structure is incorrect. You need the person who cares about the operational success of the larger initiatives, not the person who's managing also the printers, also the email. And it's not because the CIO isn't smart enough. They, they're a part of the orchestra too. But for a digital service, they have to report into the operational visionary person accountable for the success of the body. And if not, do not do it. So that's like the majority leader in Congress? Yeah. I, I'm dead serious because at this point, like, it is, it is 
you will lose the engineers that show up. You will get stuck in bureaucratic fights rather than prioritize the things that are actually the priority of the body. And the leader should be someone senior enough that that is the level of person they're used to working for anyways. You want like the former COO of Microsoft or Google or somewhere um, where they're used to working at that executive level. So I would add two things to that. One is I would also prepare that person that they're going to work for for the fact that person's not going to just is going to have to be more than just enthusiastic about them. They're going to have to be willing to spend a little political capital to defend what they're doing and to cut through things when when stuff gets in their way. The second thing I would say is I would say I would start. I would ask the Congressional Innovation Fellows, Travis, <laughs> um, <coughs> um, to dig around for a couple of low-hanging fruit problems and that 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 once you had a digital service on board, could tackle quickly and show results quickly and demonstrate the power of having a digital service team in your organization to build you know, appreciation for what's possible. Because it, it, building, the, building your portfolio of success stories makes or breaks the credibility of the entire endeavor. I guess that also goes to a more sort of long-term structural question for Congress because, you know, Congress is structured in a very different manner from uh, agencies and obviously we have the uh, CDS that's coming online and the uh, Congressional Innovation Fellows and that's really exciting, but it's still sort of like a, a, it's a, it's a project, you know, it's like, all right, all right, we'll see how it goes. And in two years with the new Congress, you know, they could arguably just wipe it away completely and say, well, that was interesting and move on. Uh, so the question is, you know, at some point, do we go back to legislators and s ask them to, in essence, create an officer of the House position that would report to the speaker or report to the majority leader so that you can then go out and get that uh, expert from, you know, somewhere in the valley or elsewhere to serve a more permanent role there, similar to, like, you know, the... Um, uh, the Capitol Chief of Police or the architect of the Capitol or, or something along those lines. Thank you, guys. Can we give a big thank you to our amazing digital service?